Welcome back uh, to this week's uh, episode. And um, this is the part of the episode each week now where we premiere a TV series or a movie that's currently out here at the moment. And uh, we give it a particular uh, spotlight. And for this week's episode, uh, we are delighted to be previewing uh, the season four of the very successful show, Private Eyes, which uh, is on currently at the moment, as you know, in Channel Sky Witness UK uh, here in Ireland. And we're delighted to have one of the stars of the show, uh, the, the Bonnie into, uh, to, to Jason Priestley's Clyde in many a sense, uh, the one and only uh, Cindy Sampson. Uh, she's appearing uh, all lovely and kind here on our, our screens in front of us, but she does play a fiery sort of character uh, on the TV episode, uh, Angie Everett. And uh, Sydney, uh, good day to you. And uh, it's great to see a smile on your face. Hi, James. Well, I'm smiling because that might, might possibly be the best intro I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> So Sydney, Sydney, um, season four, uh, Private Eye, uh, very successful. You're on to the fourth season. When you started off way back when you did the pilot in season one, uh, did you think you'd be here season heading to a season four uh, to sort of round off, which has been a very successful sort of show for you and a project and for yourself and uh, Jason Priestley uh, got to... Um, as I say, got to have a, a love hate uh, sort of uh, Bonnie and Clyde uh, sort of uh, relationship, uh, two peas in a pod, sort of. You know, I mean, I can't believe it's actually been five years since we started this show. And uh, when we started Private Eyes, we based it in Toronto and we didn't really expect it to have such international appeal. And all of a sudden, it's like showing in 180 territories around the world. And we're still going. We just finished filming season five. Um, so things are still going strong. And like every single day, Jason and I are so thankful and so happy to still be working together. And surprisingly, we still like each other after all this time. And I suppose, Sydney, uh, to find a niche in a market in terms of a detective uh, show, there's so many of them out at there at the moment. I just think of you've Nathan Fillion's The Rookie, you've the remake of uh, Magnum uh, P.I., uh, you've saw which is sort of, I wouldn't say similar in sense, but it, it's a sort of same thing, a private detective sort of show. And then you go back to the classics in terms of private agency shows like The Rockford Files. We know how legendary that was. The same sort of a, a premise, a private investigator. And to try and sort of stand out in a market where that's been done before and it's reinvented and also to capture your own, your own audience in terms of an overworked market, that's very a hard thing to do in terms of that. But you've managed to find that niche and sort of find your own audience. You know, it's true because I feel like we have really, it really is a reimagined format. It's been done before so many times and like there's a lot of similar things out there. And we just, every time that we're asked about this or we even discuss it, we're, we always equate it to the genuine relationship that I and Jason have. We feel like it just translate like Angie and Shade. We just, we just have this really good rapport. We have this really good working chemistry. We really have the same sense of humor. We have so much fun filming our show. And I feel like that really translate onto the screen enough that people enjoy watching that. And you know, it's such a lighthearted show, but like <laughs> the current state of the world is terrifying at times. And it's really nice just to have lighthearted things to go home and walk, watch on your own television at night. So. Yeah, and Cindy, you mentioned that lighthearted sort of humor and sort of banter, and we see how successful that is. You only just have to look at the chemistry, say, for example, of Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. Uh, you could just watch <laughs> those two in tangent uh, for hours on the road. There might as well be another cast around them. They could just do the, the full movie themselves in terms of uh, speaking to one each other, and you'd laugh away. So it's important for two main characters to have that sort of bond. That's uh, So when one finishes one set, Sentence, one can pick off where the other one ends. So you're almost sorry, finishing each other's sort of sentences. You're at the butt of each other's sort of jokes. And that sort of sort of a uh, mellowed sort of a team where or private agency, where you're dealing with things like murder, when you're dealing like things like 
cr plane crashes, uh, teeth, serious subjects, but to bring a sort of lighthearted twist to it and uh, not to make it so CSI in nature, that's a very hard thing to do. Yeah, I feel like we really walk the line of dramedy, like it's really a fine line between the two. And we, I mean, we're, we're an hour long format, but I find there's a lot of comedic beats and everything, but we do deal with pretty serious subject matter, which I think also is appealing because it's just, there's something for everyone. And also it's the, there's a lot of, there's a lot of family. It's a lot of family content, but I, it's just, that's the best part about Private Eyes and why we have such sustainability is because the stories never end. Mm. There's literally an infinite amount of stories that we can tell with these characters. Yeah, and you mentioned that, Sydney, the, the concept of being a private eye, because you, you can take on everything concept from a missing greyhound uh, <laughs> to, uh, a, 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 say, a, a playboy getting uh, his necklace uh, stolen that's worth half a million, you know? There's so many sort of different teams, while uh, sort of a police cop show, you're dealing with a uh, murder, you're dealing with drugs, you're dealing with that investigative side, with a private agency, you can have all sorts of things from everyone's, uh, just from the local sort of, say, baker who's got uh, fraudulent sort of stuff or the local sort of teeth. There's there are so many areas where you can go from high to low in terms of significance where you can't really sort of touch with you when you go into sort of your Starsky and Hutch type sort of uh, police shows. It's true. We're just telling the stories of the people around us at all times. As, like life imitates art, I guess. We're just constantly storytelling within our own communities. So yeah, it's a wealth, a wealth of, of things to write about, which is so fun too, because we get to go to work and every single week is so different for us. The subject matter is so vast that we always have new, interesting, ridiculous, fun, serious. It's the whole gamut. It's the full spectrum, which keeps it exciting for us. Like doing a show for this many years, nothing ever gets stale or boring. It's always new. And you must have, yourself and Jason must have bits in terms of the storyline, in terms of what will they think of sort of next, in terms of, I bet you they'll do that uh, somewhere down the line, or you can sort of roll off sort of ideas that you might see uh, walking down the street, uh, a common sort of a, a team, or you might say, do you know, that would be a good angle and maybe suggest that to the story writers or a sort of stuff like that. So it, there's so many areas of exploration around such a concept. This is very true because that happens all the time. We always think we're like, you know what? That would make a great episode. But then sometimes it gets us into trouble because there's this thing which you'll see in episode seven, the golf episode. It's called the CN Tower Edge Walk. And I'm terrified of heights. And every made a joke saying that we should do the edge walk in an episode. And they let us. So I had to go on the edge of the CN Tower outside. It's the most terrifying thing in the entire world. So sometimes the ideas for episodes are bad because I almost died of fright that day, but it was actually kind of exhilarating to conquer some fears. And when you see it, I want you to, I want you to think of me because it's really scary. <laughs> I will, Sydney, Sydney, that's no problem. Uh, at the top of uh, my memory, uh, in terms of the cerebellum, uh, you'll be there. Uh, in terms of that sort of uh, scene, you mentioned doing your sort of stunts and so many sort of TV shows with sort of big budgets, uh, they have so many sort of stunt crews and so many actors, you know, there will be like, whoa, insurance, you know, I have a project sort of coming up, I have this and that in the pipeline you know, maybe it's best off you get a double or a body double to do that. You seem to sort of mention there the sort of stunts and teams that it's very much yourself and Jason uh, biting the bullet on several occasions. We, within reason, we really try to do as much of our stunts as possible. We both have, we both have been working with the one stunt double, but each for the extent of our whole thing, we've both had the same stunt doubles who are lovely and wonderful and we love having them there, but we try not to give them much work. We really try to do it ourselves. Um, there's a pretty big jump off a tower this, mm -hmm. that we just filmed that, not, that Jason and I didn't do because we didn't want to die. No one died, but it was, uh, it was pretty scary. Yes, stunts are super interesting to me. I find them so inspiring. I want to do everything, but they also terrify me. Stunt people are hardcore. 
And uh, Sydney, uh, in terms of being a private eye, in terms of uh, the sort of when you landed a role, were you given any specific sort of uh, training? Did you do any bit of work shadowing, any bit of uh, research follow, maybe a police detective or a cop around, just to get a sort of a sense for how it sort of differs from being a regular sort of police lady on the beat, for example? See, the funny part about that is my mom works for the Department of National Defense in like okay. CSIS. And when I was growing up, I really always thought that I was going to be a detective. And so I job shadowed with a police officer way before I was an actor. But now I just play one on TV because it's not as dangerous. Um, <laughs> When we got when we started the show, we didn't act any official training because, you know, hmm. Shade and Angie's style of work is a little loose. It's a little too loose for the system, if you ask me. Um, but we have been approached by real life private investigators a lot in Toronto, surprisingly, that have offered to consult or just hang oh. out because they do it for a living, which is like the most interesting real life job. I can't even imagine how cool that would be. Perhaps scary. And Sydney, you mentioned sort of a private eye sort of investigator in terms of Angie, she sort of a fiery sort of character and you sort of try and bring that sort of serious nature in terms of comedy. We know some comedies, there are uh, police shows, there are like uh, there are Pacific comedy. You take, for example, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, that's just comedy gif uh, in terms of Melissa Fumera and her role she sort of plays in that. I remember speaking to her in the past and that's just pure comedy laughter. It's uh, yeah. pure derogatory of what a, a normal police sort of work is. So you're kind of going up a sort of level. You're missing, mixing the sort of serious with that sort of lighthearted team to say, right, we don't want to make it uh, too over the top in terms of, a, a, in terms of its violence, but we don't want to make it uh, too sort of goofy either. Yeah, we, we really, we really found our niche and we just kind of stick with it. I mean, we do veer outside of it. Some are more serious. And it's funny because some episodes are so ridiculous that, that, they make us laugh and then others are quite serious. And then there's some that are a really solid mix between the two, the two, but I feel like we always come back to that lighthearted road, that really like family oriented blue sky version of the show. And that's really what's kept our longevity. Hmm. And I suppose Sydney starting off in terms of a uh, private eye and uh you obviously you got cast for the role you probably found out before you got cast maybe that Jason Priestley was involved and you probably remember Jason from Beverly Hills 90210 <laughs> sort of a teenage sort of um I'd say more advanced type of Save by the Bell a bit more adult sort of team sort of drama did you probably get that sort of sense that well that's what you saw him for and then coming on playing a sort of detective sort of show did he surprise you was he very different from what you thought he might be in terms of his acting sort of genre because you actually see him now in Beverly Hills 902010 if someone asked you having known him personally well first off I was actually I was in high school when the original Beverly Hills 90210 aired and I watched it along with everyone else back then there was like not many shows and everyone watched the same thing so i was absolutely in love with beverly hills 90210 so when i found out i was going to be working with jason it was a little bit weird because i had this massive high school crush on him and then when we first started private eyes angie was the boss hmm. and he, and shade was just an employee and i was like how am i gonna boss around jason Priestley? But it came quite easily. <laughs> he's, the kind of guy you just, he's the kind of guy you just want to boss around, I guess. The truth of the matter is he's he's got such a great attitude and he's been in this business so long that he's super fun. We get along really well and he, he creates a really good environment on set. So it's just so easy working with him that, yes, I was very much surprised by that. I was surprised by how humble and lovely and funny and all of the good things he was and like seemingly unaffected by essentially being a massive star for so many years and 
that was surprising. And then everything else just came really easily. And Sydney, uh, I suppose we're talking about season four and some of the teams that we have here in season four, we have a Gatsby type uh, team party murder an attempted theft involving a food truck, uh, a celebrity <laughs> golf you're talking about, a mysterious jazz club uh, disappearance. Uh, always, there always has to be a bit of a, a drama come a, a wedding, but a, a plane crash and a wedding uh, doesn't go side by side in many a case and uh, sort of uh, runaway crooks. But it's important to note as well that you do have uh, to every sort of new season, there needs to be a new sort of spice or sort of new blood sort of to strengthen the show. And you've made additions to, uh, in terms of season four. Um, Canadian singer Keisha Shante has come on board. Yep, she plays Angie's very first good girlfriend. We're very excited about it. We had a great time working together. She w also returns in season five, which is amazing. So two seasons, Angie finally has a gal pal to hang out with. Um, Sexy Taxi is returning as Angie's love interest. Um, I believe he makes his debut in episode three, which would be airing the, the next episode you'll all be seeing. We also introduce um, Sapinder Rach, which is, okay. she's playing Kate, Danica, Danica, the detective, her fiance. So we okay. do have some new characters showing up. Also, it, I, if anyone watches basketball, we are the coach, the head coach of the Toronto Raptors, Nick Nurse, is in the golf episode. Okay. Golfer Scott Weir, Scott Weir is in that episode. Scott McGillivray, who has a show on HGTV, is it's like just stacked with like celebrities. It's a pretty, it's a pretty great season. I would say it's by far Angie's best season. Mm. Um, aside from the CN Tower Edge Walk, which when you see what I'm talking about, everyone will freak out. Um, the jazz episode, Angie gets to sing. I actually got to sing, which and like perform on a stage in like a jazz club, which was so much fun. And the Toronto International Film Festival episode, um, we have like an old school beat down, like a brawl, mm -hmm. like a fight. And I got to do all my stunts in that. And that was really fun. You so got to throw a few punches. I got to throw it through a few punches and I took down some bad dudes. And I mean, I guess you, the last episode, you guys just all saw Angie running around in a uh, mermaid outfit. So yeah, that was another highlight of the season. <laughs> and I suppose, uh, Sydney, uh, 12 episodes and a personal milestone for you as well. You made your uh, de debut uh, direction, uh, directing a sort of an episode, uh, getting uh, behind the, the camera and uh, I suppose uh, giving the orders as what you give uh, Matt the orders, you give the whole cast the orders in terms <laughs> of this episode. You know, it was really a milestone for me in my career because I've been doing this for a long, long, long time, 20 plus years. And it's my directorial debut, episode three. It was amazing. And the writers did such a fabulous job because they wrote an episode where Angie gets kidnapped. And that gave me a lot of screen time I gave me, well, it took away a lot of screen time and it gave me the chance to actually be a director and sit behind the camera. And it was so, it was frightening because I'd never done it before, but it was so magical. And I was really surrounded by support of a cast and crew that I've worked with for so long. And I had the best time and the episode turned out pretty great. I'm quite proud of that episode. Um, but you know, it's a collaborative effort and I could never have done it on my own. It was surrounded by an amazing team of people. And that's just the beginning. Now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna start directing things. It's and, pretty uh, cool. Sydney, I, I suppose uh, the, the word no one wants to talk about the two words that the most hated words in the last sort of two years, uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, did you get the season four sort of wrapped up and concluded before March uh, 2020? Is we your... did. Yes, we did. So we finished at, we finished season four and we were supposed to go back for season five in April 4th, okay. 2020. You we ended up. So. Well, yeah. And then we were supposed to go back for season five and then everything got uh, was closed down and we we shot 
a small truncated season that was eight episodes only starting in September of 2020. And we just filmed until December, 2020. So we, sh we got eight episodes during the pandemic, all wearing PPE, all getting tested every day and full gear. And it was not as fun <laughs> as every other year, but it was wonderful that we could pull it off and everyone got to go to work and and we still got to make our show. So we're super proud of that. And extenuating circumstances, it was difficult, but everyone worked together really well to do it. And my goodness, the world is a strange place right now. I just can't wait <laughs> until things resume. And Sydney, I know we're premiering uh, season four and you mentioned about uh, filming season five. I don't, I, I'm not going to ask you about the storylines of season five because it's season four that we have yeah. here. But just in terms of um, your life, in terms of filming uh, season five, obviously it's very much like elite sort of athletes. You have that sort of bubble sort of concept, I imagine, on the set on the, where you were, you were probably filming in Canada because... I believe that very little production went on in the United States, uh, obviously, because it's much worse down there. But it was a very much the case of you having an apartment up, up there while you were filming in um, the season five, going to work every day, coming home, uh, eating, uh, cut, distancing yourself from everyone else and going back in as a cast to make it sort of work for eight or nine months. Because I imagine that it only takes one person to step out of line and then it's kaboosh for everyone. Pretty much. We, we, we all work together. So the entire cast and crew, just we all isolated away from the rest of the world so that we could make the show. And people were happy to do that because so many people have lost their jobs, obviously, and are in really tough times. So it was, it was really great that everyone could go back to work and everyone was just willing to make the sacrifices they needed to do so that we could make that happen. It was strange and isolating, but it was lovely. And obviously we couldn't hug each other or even be close to each other, but we still got to create something during a horrible pandemic. And for that, we are grateful. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was, it was weird. It was strange. It was very tough at times. We, we, we all look back and talk about it now. And we're like, that was really difficult. It was quite difficult, but Luckily, Canada, we have reopened. Everyone's very careful and super, it's super strict, but we still have managed to keep filming going. And we had maybe two periphery cases. So they were never in a red zone. So never close to the core cast and crew um, in the, all the months that we were filming and we never got shut down. So we were all quite proud of ourselves for following protocol so well. I suppose an awful lot of imaginary sort of fist pumps so uh, <laughs> in, in Sydney. Uh, Sydney, I suppose that uh, we're getting to the conclusion and I suppose the penultimate uh, question for you now, and probably the hardest one I ask uh, my guests in terms of this, uh, let's pretend there was an encyclopedia, a sort of private eyes encyclopedia, a dictionary as such. And uh, maybe 10 years from now, the, they were doing up this uh, encyclopedia and they put the character Angie Everett uh, into the encyclopedia. Probably she'd be on the first page, obviously, uh, with, uh, Matt's, uh, with Matt as well, uh, Jason's uh, character. And uh, if someone said to you to write that synopsis uh, to describe uh, Angie in terms of uh, the left two blank sentences underneath her name, what would you like those two sentences to read? It's not an epitaph, no. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Feisty, but lovable. Loner private investigator falls in love with a conceited hockey player. And the rest is history. <laughs> Loner and hockey player, uh, two words that... Uh, you wouldn't sort of associate it uh, going uh, together. And uh, lastly, uh, Sydney Samson, we'll turn it over to your character, Angie Everett, for the last 30 seconds. But why should all our audience here in Ireland tune in uh, at the moment to watch uh, season four of Private Eye here on channel Sky Witness UK? Where, as we said, we're coming up to that third episode, uh, your de debut uh, direct uh, directorial uh, episode. What's in store for us? And uh, over to Angie for the final 30 seconds. Take it away. 
Well, this episode, Angie gets kidnapped. So Shade teams up with Tex, the unlikely duo looking for their girl, their girl. Nora teams up with Zoe and Kate and Danica team up. We have three teams out there looking for Angie Everett. Tune in because it's a twisty, windy road. Train track, actually. I should have said train track. Also, thank you all to everyone at Sky Witness and UK. I mean, we know the ratings. We know who's been watching us over there. And we're super grateful for the support all the time. Uh, on that note, uh, Sydney Sampson, an absolute pleasure talking to you. Uh, season four, hopefully, uh, will be very successful. And no doubt, season five will follow on those uh, sort of tracks as well. But for this moment, uh, Sydney, uh, do take care. Enjoy the weather where you are. I know, uh, <laughs> I know uh, it's not the same can be said uh, here. I know, uh, so do uh, bask in the sunlight while you have it before the storm makes your way uh, to uh, nor the Northern he Hemisphere and uh, North America <laughs> as such. But for the moment, uh, Sydney, uh, do take care and uh, do put your feet up. Thanks so much, James. It was great talking to you. Cheers. Take care, Sydney.